Hello, and welcome to this video where we're going to learn to build a retro gaming console with Raspberry Pi. So why would you want to do this? Well, retro gaming is hot right now. Uh, if you grew up when I did, uh, those 8-bit and 16-bit games were all the rage, and they're, it's funny that they're kind of back now, and some of the gameplay in those games is still better than uh, anything else that's out there. So even though the graphics are simple um, and primitive compared to today's modern graphics, uh, the gameplay is a lot of fun. And so this is a fun project that a lot of people tend to do when they get a brand new Raspberry Pi. It's fairly straightforward. Hopefully this video will be an asset to you. I won't say it's easy. There is some uh, work you have to do, but it's fairly straightforward and there's a lot you can do with it once you build it. So we'll learn how to build uh, the uh, simple beginnings of it today and then I'll show you some things you can do later on to maybe make your project more extensive. Okay. So what are you going to need? Well, there's several things you're going to need. You're obviously going to need a Raspberry Pi and I have my Raspberry Pi 3 here. Um, I recommend the Raspberry Pi 3. As of this recording, this is in July of 2020, the Raspberry Pi 4 is out. Um, it's certainly a more powerful Raspberry Pi, but it has some different requirements in terms of power and connectors. And a lot of the stuff that you're going to buy online is still kind of made for the older Raspberry Pis. So Raspberry Pi 3 is plenty fast. It'll play most retro consoles pretty well. But if you're looking for the top speed and really want to emulate some of the more modern systems, uh, go with the Raspberry Pi 4. The Raspberry Pi 3 is also cheaper right now. It's the one that you can get for $35. Um, so you'll need that. You'll need an HDMI cable. You'll need at least a 32 gigabyte micro SD card. You can technically get a little smaller, but I wouldn't go much smaller than that. And honestly, if you're going to have a lot of games, I would try to get even bigger. Um, you can get those at different prices right now. And I'll show you some links later on where some of the cheaper prices are but uh, you can get those at a variety of places pretty easily you're going to need a power supply uh, and this slideshow will be in the link description so where you see active links here you'll be able to click on those and i'll provide all the links as well in the description so don't worry about finding those i'll, I'll make them easy for you to get you're going to need a 5 volt 2.5 uh, amp power supply and that's important with the raspberry pi 3 you need to make sure you have at least 5 volts and 2.5 amps um, the RetroPie uh, software does tax the Raspberry Pi pretty hard, and so you want to make sure you have a good power supply, because if you don't, if you have an older one or a power supply that doesn't give you as much power, it could uh, damage the Raspberry Pi or just not work correctly. You're going to need a game controller, so you see a picture there. I like the 8-bit do ones, and I'll show you where um, you can get those, uh, but any USB game controller will work, generally. Um, you'll need an HDMI TV or a monitor. And then just for the setup, you're going to need another computer and then a USB keyboard. Once you have the setup complete, you can you obviously won't need those. But to be able to get games or what we call ROMs from, um, you, you, from the Internet onto your Raspberry Pi, there's several ways to do it. But the way I'm going to show you requires another computer. So you'll definitely want to have another computer ready to go. And then you'll need some games to play. And so we'll spend some time talking about it, that as well because that part can be a little tricky. Like I said, you can use an older Raspberry Pi, and Raspberry Pi 2 would, would work as well, but it'll just be obviously a little slower. Um, but for the older systems, the 8-bit and the 16-bit systems, so like your Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Sega, Genesis, those, a Raspberry Pi 2 will be fine. And you can also use a Raspberry Pi 4, like I mentioned, but as you see here in this uh, I image, you, it has uh, a smaller micro HDMI port, so then you need a special adapter or a special caber, cable. <laughs> you also need a USB-C connector um, for power. And, you know, if you have a modern smartphone, you might have that. Not an iPhone, but a modern Android phone, you might already have that. But typically, a lot of people have the stuff already around their house, or they can get it fairly cheap uh, with the Raspberry Pi 3. So that's the one that we're going to use in this video. Um, and that's one I recommend, but do realize you can use a 2. I wouldn't go much lower than the 2, although you can use the Raspberry Pi Zero, which is maybe another vi video to do more handheld style gaming. This is going to be designed to be hooked up to an HDMI TV or a monitor. Okay, so next we're going to look at uh, what are the steps to get started. All right, so you got all your supplies. Now you're ready to start building your retro gaming console. So the first thing that you're going to need to do is, is you're going to need to get your SD card formatted and install the RetroPie uh, operating system, basically, onto the SD card. 
Um, and so basically there are lots of different ways you can do emulation or what are called front ends sometimes on a Raspberry Pi. Basically you need some software on your Raspberry Pi that will control all the emulators. Those are the pieces of software that allow you to play your games. Um, and then also the user interface allow you to select the emulators and the games and configuration and stuff. And we're going to see all that um, as we go here. Um, so RetroPie is probably the most common and certainly the most user friendly. There are other systems out there that you can use to do retro gaming on a Raspberry Pi, but I've always used RetroPie and have had a lot of success with it and it's pretty stable. But there are other options, especially if you really want to start configuring things and getting real, you know, down to the hardware level with some detail. But RetroPie will allow you to do a lot of that as well. So the first thing you need to do then is go on the internet and download RetroPie. Actually, now starting, uh, I'm recording this video in July of 2020. They've actually built in the, re the RetroPie uh, operating system into the Raspberry Pi downloader. So you don't even need to go, the, to get, go and get this image anymore. Or an image is basically like the uh, software that you're going to put on the SD card. So you could go to the official RetroPie website right here that's linked in the, you know, again, these links will be in the description and download it, but you don't even need to do that anymore. You can go right to the second link and you're going to download the official Raspberry Pi imager. So when you click that, it'll take you here. And depending on your host operating system, so remember I said earlier, you need to have uh, a regular computer to get started just for the configuration. So you can download it for Windows, Mac, or if you have Linux, uh, machine you can do that as well you can even actually install this on another Raspberry Pi but I, I assume most people are probably on Windows or Mac so you're gonna download that and once you download it it'll look um, like this and what it'll allow you to do is install an image or the basically the operating system onto your SD card so you're gonna get your SD card and um, you're gonna put it in a little adapter so I have this old USB adapter here you can buy these online um, or this is a USB one as well, but basically you need to get your SD card to be recognized by your computer. Now, if you're on a laptop or something, you probably have an SD card or built into your laptop, but I'm on a desktop here, so I need to use one of these adapters. So you will need to have one of these um, available to be able to uh, install the software. And so you put your SD card in here, and then I plug this in via USB. And when I do that, it'll show up here where it says choose card. So I'll go ahead and do that now, and I'll plug that into my computer. And then what's going to happen is it's going to ask you to choose an operating system because, again, we want to be able to install what's called an image or basically a snapshot of all the stuff we need right onto our SD card. So I'm going to choose, click the one that says choose OS, and notice I can do, lot, I have lots of different options. But starting in July of 2020, literally just a couple days ago, they added this option here, turn your Raspberry Pi into a retro gaming machine. So that's all you have to do now to get the software. Before you actually had to go out and download it and, and set it up that way, but now they've built it right into to this uh, program, the Raspberry Pi Imager. So I'll choose that. It's going to ask me which version I want. I'm going to remember I recommended getting a Raspberry Pi 3, but if you have a Raspberry Pi 4, you're going to choose that option. Or if you have an older Raspberry Pi 0 or one of the older machines, it, it gives you all the options. But I'm going to choose the one that says Raspberry Pi 2 or 3 because I'm on a 3. And then I need to choose my SD card. And so um, right now my SD card is mounted there. So it's basically, again, if you're on a laptop, you would just plug your SD card right into the SD card reader on the side of your laptop. But if you're on a desktop, you would uh, choose the option that it's basically the USB drive where you've plugged in the adapter. So you plug the adapter into the computer via USB, and then you put the SD card into the, um, into the, into the USB adapter. All right, and then you click write, and what that does is it writes the operating system to the SD card. This process can take anywhere, depending on the speed of your computer, three or four minutes up to maybe 10 minutes. So kind of go and go, you know, take a break. And uh, when you come back, it should be ready to go. And then we'll go on to the next step. So once you have the operating system, RetroPie, or the image installed on the SD card, now it's time to hook everything up to your Raspberry Pi and turn it on. So what you'll do is you'll take your Raspberry Pi, you'll take your SD card now and take it out of the adapter if you put it in one and you're going to carefully insert it into the Raspberry Pi where the SD card goes. 
Uh, do be careful at this step. Um, you don't want to force it in there. It doesn't click or uh, does it, sometimes it's, it, it's kind of just using force to kind of set it in there. So be real care careful that you don't push too hard. Uh, it will stick off the edge a little bit. Sometimes beginners, are, they see that it's not flush there and they get a little nervous and they push harder and harder. I've actually break, broken these off before. Uh, so do be careful. Push it in there until you can't really push it anymore and it should be good to go. Um, at this point, then you're going to hook up your USB uh, controller. So um, you can use Bluetooth or wireless controllers, but I would recommend for the initial setup, use a USB controller. Uh, again, links in the description for the one I like, but there are literally probably dozens and dozens of USB controllers that you can use. Um, and I know a lot of people like wireless and you can do wireless because it has Bluetooth, but I found it's easier to set up uh, one via USB first and then set up your Bluetooth one later on. Um, you also need to hook in a USB keyboard. You'll just need this for the initial setup, things like connecting your Raspberry Pi to, to the Wi-Fi network and that type of things, because that's how we're going to get our ROMs or our games onto our Raspberry Pi is through the internet, through, or I should say through a network, through Wi-Fi. Um, and then the last thing is to plug in your HDMI, uh, HDMI cable. I, I guess second to last thing, plug in your HDMI cable. Uh, you want to do all that first. Raspberry Pis are very finicky. If you turn it on and then start plugging in things, often you're going to have some issues. Um, it might not even work. So I tell everybody, plug everything in first, and then the very, very last step is to turn it on. So you have everything connected, then finally plug in your USB power, or your, yeah, your micro USB power. Um, my, my power uh, adapter actually has an on-off switch on it, a little clicker. Yours may or may not, but the second you plug it in, if it doesn't have an on-off switch, uh, res the Raspberry Pi will turn on. On the board itself, there is no on or off. So as soon as you give it power, it's going to boot up. Um, also, make sure your TV or your monitor is turned on ahead of time. That's a tip that often can mess people up as they plug everything in. They turn on the Raspberry Pi. Then they turn on their TV or in the monitor. I've found it better to have everything plugged in and turned on first. And the very, very last thing is then to plug in the power. Okay. So once you do that, you should boot up. And uh, the next step here, we'll look at what you're going to see when it, when it boots up. All right. So once you get everything hooked up, turn the power on or plug it in. And it'll take anywhere from 10 to 30 seconds or so to boot up. You might see some things pop up in your screen, but eventually you're going to see this screen here. So what we need to do is we need to configure our controller or our gamepad. So here is an example of what you might see, and it's going to say one gamepad detected. Now this is assuming that you have a compatible gamepad or a compatible controller. Again, look for the links in the description for the one I use, and I'll put some other suggestions in there as well. Um, because if it doesn't detect it automatically, it can be much trickier to try to set all, do all the setup. So hopefully it auto detects it automatically via USB. And then what you're going to do is you're going to press and hold a button on your device because you need to configure your gamepad, your controller, to RetroPie. So I'm going to hold down a button. Notice here it says D-pad up. So press anything. So on my controller, I'm going to use my D-pad. This is the D-pad here. I'm going to press up because I want that to be up on my D-pad. I want to press down. You can see the different instructions here. I'm just going through each step. I'm going to press select, or sorry, start. Now I'm going to do select. I'm going to do the A button. So now I have face buttons, these buttons here. Again, I'm using this 8-bit DO uh, controller, the one I recommend. If you have something slightly different, your configuration is going to be a little different. If you have a, a newer Xbox controller or a PS4 controller, um, it'll still work, but you'll just have to do the configuration yourself. And in this slideshow, I have some suggestions. We'll look at them next year um, on how to do that. But I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you're using this controller here because this one works really well and it's very easy to get started uh, configuring it. So I'm going to press the A button. I'm going to press B. I'm going to press X, Y. I have uh, shoulder and trigger buttons as well. So the shoulder buttons are these at the very, very top here. So I'm going to do left shoulder, right shoulder. And then this one has trigger buttons as well down here, the bigger buttons. So I'm going to do left trigger, left trigger, and right trigger. All right, so on mine, it doesn't seem to be configuring now. So if it doesn't configure, if it doesn't work, you can just press anything, and it'll skip over that. So my triggers aren't working right now. Most of the games I play uh, aren't going to use triggers, so I'm not going to worry about it, but I can always come back to this. Now it says left thumb, so I have thumbsticks here, so I'm going to press that in. I'm going to do right thumb, and now I'm going to do my analog up. So this is the analog or thumbstick, and so I'm going to do up on that, so I'm going to push it up, push it down, left, right, and then I'm going to do the same thing for my right analog stick, so the one on the right here. 
this one, sorry, this one right here. So I'm going to do up, down, left, right. And then this hotkey, this is important because this is going to allow you to exit your emulators and exit, exit your games. I'm actually going to keep it blank. I'm just going to skip over it because when, then what it'll do is it'll give you a warning and it, it seems to work better if you do it this way. So where it says press anything, I'm just going to skip it. So I'm going to, I press down on my D-pad. I'm going to go to OK. I'm going to select that. <clears throat> and then if it asks you, what it'll say is, mine didn't ask me in that particular case. So I'm going to do this real quick again, just to see if I can get it to pop up, because I want to show you what you're going to press. So let's do, I'm going to just do this real quick. You can see how fast you can do this. Go through it quickly here. Already taken, so I'm just going to skip. I'm going to hold down a button to skip, hold down a button to skip. I'm going to do my left thumb, right thumb. Try to do this quick for you here. All right, hotkey enabled. I actually want my hotkey to be the start button. All right, so I'm going to press start, and then there we go, and that, that should work. Okay, so I'm going to hit OK. And now we're back at, or I should say now we're at our configuration screen. So when RetroPie first boots up, if you don't have any games or what we call ROMs, and we're going to talk about what ROMs and games are next, this is all you're going to see because RetroPie is smart enough to say, hey, I don't, I don't see any games that you have on your system, so I'm just showing your configuration. And so we'll go over a little bit of what you can do in this configuration. Okay, so hopefully this part can be a little tricky. So hopefully you get through this part. I'll provide some links in, some, in the description as well for some more tutorials that might help you. But generally, if, you, if you're using this controller that I'm using here, this 8-bit DO one, again, the link will be in the description. Um, I find this, the controller set up fairly straightforward. Um, here's what we just did. So we, we used the D-pad, we mapped our A, B, X, Y buttons. We did shoulder buttons, we did trigger buttons, and then we set up our hotkey. Okay, so the next thing we're going to look at now is maybe the thing that you're probably thinking about is, all right, how do I get games on here? How do I get what we call ROMs onto my Raspberry Pi into RetroPie? And that's what we'll look at next. Okay, so let's talk about games or what are often called ROMs in emulation. RetroPie uses a, a program called Emulation Station to play your games. You really don't need to know that because it's built into RetroPie. As I mentioned earlier, you can really configure a lot in RetroPie and really get into the hardware and do some really crazy things. But for beginners here, just realize that RetroPie is really a series of uh, programs put together to make an overall retro console. And so we're using something called Emulation Station. Um, and, and again, Emulation Station or RetroPie calls your games ROMs. So when you're looking online, that's what you're really looking for, that word R-O-M-S, ROMs. Um, so we, for what we need to do first is we need to make it easy to transfer our ROMs. And I'm going to use a Windows 10 computer. If you're on a Mac, it'll, it'll work a little different, but I'm just going to assume that you're on a Windows 10 computer um, because this is how we're going to get our games downloaded from the Internet or our ROMs. Um, onto our Windows 10 computer, and then we're going to connect our Windows 10 computer in our Raspberry Pi to our same network, and that way we can transfer our games over the network that way. There are other ways to do that. this. You can actually install ROMs onto a USB drive and plug that into your um, Raspberry Pi, and so I'll leave some links in the descriptions that show you some alternative ways of adding ROMs to your game or to your RetroPie Raspberry Pi, but we're going to do the network way just because I think this is the most sustainable long term. But do realize there are other ways and there are other tutorials out there that'll show you how. Um, so let's talk about finding ROMs. Here's the big thing that I want to emphasize it is illegal to download games or ROMs from the internet that you do not own. In other words, you must have the game cartridge from the old game systems. So if you want to play RC Pro-Am from a Nintendo, you have to own the cartridge. And even technically then, the law is a little iffy, but the law does say that if you own the ca cartridge, you're, you're allowed to make a backup digital copy of your game. The problem is that you can go on the internet and you can find hundreds, if not thousands of ROMs to download. And unless you own every single one of those cartridges for every single game, technically you're breaking the law. So I'm not going to show you how to get illegal ROMs. I will tell you it is not hard 
to find ROMs for games that you do not own. I'll just leave it at that. I'm going to show you some ROMs that you can use that are open source or the authors or the developers have made the game free to download. And so they've given you the, the license to be able to do that. Um, there's things called ROM hacks, which is a little more uh, gray area, whether it's legal or not. And I'm going to show you those as well. But if you want to play Mario Brothers on your RetroPie, Super Mario Brothers, you have to own the cartridge if you want to legally play it. Um, so we're just going to leave it at that. But there are, like I said, a lot of homebrew, open source, or ROM hacks that you can uh, play on your RetroPie to get started. And then I'll leave it up to you on your comfort level of finding other ROMs. But it's not hard to find those ROMs online. I'll just say that. Okay. So we're that's what we're going to look at next. We're going to figure out how to get the ROMs from the Internet. We're going to download them on our Windows 10 computer. And then we're going to transfer them from Windows 10 to our Raspberry Pi. So that's what we'll look at next. All right, so now that you know a little bit about ROMs and games and what they are, now we need to figure out how to actually get them from the Internet onto our Raspberry Pi. And there are a couple ways to do that. Like I mentioned earlier, you can actually go on your Windows 10 PC or a Mac and plug a USB drive in and download the ROMs to that. And then you can plug it in on your Raspberry Pi, and there's some some steps you can do that that will automatically copy them over. I'll provide a link in the description on how to do that um, if that's the method you want to go, but I generally find for long-term viability and in the fact that you're going to want to probably do this lots of different times, the USB method can be a little cumbersome and tiresome, so setting up Wi-Fi is probably your best bet. Plus, once your Raspberry Pi is on Wi-Fi, you get some other advantages there as well. So you're going to probably want to do Wi-Fi anyway, regardless of how you get your ROMs on your Raspberry Pi. So uh, remember that um, you need Wi-Fi on the Raspberry Pi. So the Raspberry Pi 3 does have Wi-Fi built in. Or if you get a Raspberry Pi 0W, it's called the Zero, which is a small uh, Raspberry Pi. It's meant more for like handheld type stuff if you want to do handheld gaming. The W stands for wireless. But if you have a Raspberry Pi 1 or 2, it doesn't have built-in Wi-Fi. I might have mentioned earlier that the 2 does. It actually doesn't. So you need to have the Raspberry Pi 3, that's the one I recommend that I mentioned earlier. But if you have a 4, that also has built-in Wi-Fi. If you have a Raspberry Pi 2, what you need to do is buy a Wi-Fi dongle, and you can get those on Amazon or other places online for fairly cheap. Um, again, links will be in the description if you want to purchase one of those, because you don't want to buy a Raspberry Pi 3, because maybe you already have the 2. But regardless, getting Wi-Fi on there is a good idea. Now also, you can just use Ethernet if you want. You can use the direct Ethernet connection that's on the port here. So Raspberry Pi 1 even has that on it. So if you don't want to do Wi-Fi at all, you can just plug in Ethernet. The issue there that is that you have to be close to your router, because generally you'd need to plug the cable from the router into your Raspberry Pi. And if you end up putting your Raspberry Pi in a den or a living room or a bedroom or something, you're probably not close to the router, and so then you're going to need Wi-Fi. But do realize you can use Ethernet, the old school, you know, kind of where you plug in the network. That'll work as well, because basically the idea here is we just want to get our Raspberry Pi on the network so we can easily transfer our ROMs from our Windows 10 computer to our Raspberry Pi. So what you'll see is you'll go into the configuration screen that you see here, and down you'll, you'll scroll down, and you'll go down where it says Wi-Fi, and you'll choose that. Um, it might give you a warning, something about it says you haven't set up your Wi-Fi country yet. Sometimes that warning comes up. I think on newer versions of RetroPie, they've, they've kind of uh, gotten rid of it. But regardless, if it does come up, you, you probably want to do this either way. So it'll say, do you want to launch Raspi Config? And so you'll hit that. You'll hit yes. If it doesn't ask you that, then you can also choose Raspi Config over in the configuration menu. But either way, you want to get to this screen, and then it'll say, it'll ask you to choose what's called localization options. Remember, the Raspberry Pi was actually developed and still is manufactured in the UK. So it's kind of out of the box. It thinks it's in the United Kingdom. So you have to, and Wi-Fi works slightly different in different countries. It uses different frequencies and stuff. And so basically, you have to tell it which country you're in so it can kind of uh, update the software and the firmware to, to use the correct uh, wavelengths, basically, I, I think is kind of how it works. So regardless, choose, uh, once you go into Raspi Config, you're going to go to the localization, localization options, number four, and then the next screen you'll see here is it'll ask you to change your Wi-Fi country. Again, the default is usually the UK, United Kingdom, so you're going to want to go in there and change it to US. You can also go in here and change your time zone. I would actually recommend setting up your keyboard as a US keyboard because a UK style keyboard is actually slightly different. The keys are in slightly different spots in terms of the, some of the symbols. The letters and the numbers are all the same, obviously, but some of your symbols and stuff 
especially if you have complicated passwords, Wi-Fi passwords that use, use symbols, you're going to want to change where it says change keyboard layout. You're going to change that to the United States as well. And then you can choose like just a generic 101 key keyboard type thing. Okay, so you can do that. And then next, um, <clears throat> again, like it says here, if you're using Ethernet, you don't have to do any of this because you're already connected to the Internet if you're plugged in with Ethernet to your router. But again, I think Wi-Fi is probably a better option for more, most people. And now you can go back down to the Wi-Fi setting in your in uh, your configuration screen. And then this you'll you'll click Wi-Fi or you'll choose Wi-Fi with your controller. At this point, you probably still have your keyboard in plugged in. So you can use the keyboard mouse or sorry, the keyboard arrows, or you can use the, your controller that you have. Um, and then go down to Wi-Fi and then you're going to choose connect to a Wi-Fi network. All right. Choose a Wi-Fi network. And then you should see all the Wi-Fi networks uh, that are available in your house. So again, remember, this only works on a Raspberry Pi 3. That's the one I recommend or a 4. Or if you have an older one or two, you need to get a, a Wi-Fi dongle or Wi-Fi adapter. And those, again, those are fairly cheap, but it's another thing you have to buy. So just be aware of that. So choose your network and then you should be able to type in your password. OK, and once you type in your password, that's why you plugged in the keyboard, because this is where you have to type in your Wi-Fi password. And then you're done with your keyboard, actually. So once you get it connected to the Internet or the Wi-Fi, or again, if you're using Ethernet, you don't even need the keyboard. But if you're using Wi-Fi, you got to type in your password. Uh, hit OK. You might have to do a reboot. I don't think in this stage it'll ask you to reboot. I can't remember. I don't think it does. But it, it, it's always a good idea to reboot when you make some system level changes, uh, as I've mentioned in the past. And, you know, adding your Raspberry Pi to the network is definitely a system level, level change. Um, and so um, that'll, you know, you might want to do a restart. OK, so we're connected to the network. Now the next step is going to be, you know, now that we're connected, we have an Internet connection. We're going we're gonna to look at uh, expanding the SD card, and we'll, we'll learn that in the next step. And then finally, we'll get to download some ROMs from the Internet on our Windows 10 computer and transfer them via Wi-Fi or Ethernet, if you're using Ethernet, over to your Raspberry Pi. So give this a shot. The Wi-Fi usually can, can sometimes can trip people up a little bit, but give it a shot. Link's in the description. And once you're good with this part, we'll go to the next part. All right. Good luck. All right, the next step is you need to expand your SD card. And like it says here, if you have an SD card that's larger than four gigabytes, which you should be using a 32, um, if you're using 16, this should still work, but anything bigger than four gigabytes, you must expand it before your Pi can actually use all the remaining space. It just has to do with the technical side of how it stores things on the SD card. So you're gonna go back to that configuration screen that we saw there earlier, um, the main one that, that should be in RetroPie, and you're gonna go down to RASP, config right so run that and then when you run that when you open that up you should see a screen like this and one of your first options I believe on the the first thing it should see is expand file system and you want to click that and run it uh, or hit enter you might have to use your keyboard and hit enter there and then once it's done it'll either it'll probably warn you but if it doesn't you definitely need to reboot your uh, Raspberry Pi and what we'll do is now when uh, it reboots you'll have all the storage available on your SD card and this will be important um, once you start putting games on there. If you don't do this, then what you'll find is that as you start putting more than five, six, seven, eight, ten games on there, you'll you'll get an error message or some weird messages that'll say you don't have any space. And it'll be confusing because you'll say, well, wait a second, I got a 32 gigabyte card. That's that's huge for these old games. These old games didn't take up a lot of space. But if you don't do this step, if you don't expand the SD card space, um, you'll run into some issues. So go ahead and do that next. All right, we're going to keep going here. So next you have to set up something called Samba. I believe it's how it's pronounced. And it's an acronym, and honestly, I don't know what it stands for. But basically, it's a way for your Raspberry Pi to talk to your Windows 10 computer. Uh, if you understand how operating systems work and that type of thing, you'll realize that not every operating system like Windows understands or can talk to other operating systems. They're just different underlying technologies. So you see you need some kind of common language, a translator basically, if you will, to be able to talk for the two systems to talk to each other. And Samba is a way to set up Raspberry Pi so that it can recognize and talk to things on a Windows 10 machine. So what you're going to do is you're going to go into Raspberry Pi configuration again. So we'll go here to configuration and then we're this time we're going to go to RetroPie setup. So you'll run that and in here there's a lot of things you can do in here to, to kind of mess things up. So be a little careful on what you do in here. You don't want to start changing things uh, without knowing what to do. So what we're going to do here is we're going to go to the option 
uh, let's see, it says we're going to go down to configuration and tools. All right, so I'm going to go down here to configuration and tools. And then in here, you probably have something that might say Samba. Yours might look slightly different in my, but you're looking for S-A-M-B-A. -A. That's what you want to do. And so you click that, and then you're going to go ahead and install the Samba shares uh, uh, um, feature. So I believe you need internet access for this. So that's why we did the Wi-Fi thing first, because I think this goes out to the internet and downloads it for the internet, I believe. Um, but you're going to go through this step here. So we did that, install Samba. All right, and you're going to do that. So we'll go back over here. We're going to install Samba. And then once you've done that, so we'll install these right here. It's going to do its thing. It says it should go pretty quick. All right, and then what we have to do is, in my case, I've already um, installed it. But then you have to go back a screen, and this can be a little confusing. So you're going to go back, and I'm going to go back again. And I'm going to go down here to Update RetroPy Setup Script. Uh, the reason you have to do this is it's it, and it says right here in the instructions here now choose cancel to back up and then choose in in up to the choose an option window and then back to return to the retro pie setup script all right <laughs> it gets kind of tricky here but basically what what we want to do here is back at this screen where it says update retro pie setup script this is going to basically reconfigure everything so that all the changes you made will, will will happen and then i do believe you have to do another restart so you would go in here go down and in the by the way to get to your restart screen I don't think I've showed you this yet but if you set up the controller the way I showed you in in the one of the prior videos if you press the start button that'll bring you your main menu and you can go down here to quit and you can just hit restart system and that'll reboot your Raspberry Pi and then the whole thing will reboot and it'll come back up and any of the changes you made will be updated um, when you're using Raspberry Pi operating system it's based on Linux uh, and it can be um, a lot of times when you make changes, you have to restart the machine for those changes to take effect. So once you've done all that, uh, follow the step di uh, step directions you see in here, and hopefully you'll see these screenshots uh, on yours as well. But follow these directions, restart, and then we should be getting close to uh, where we're going to actually install the games. Now the last step, or the second to last step before we actually get the games on there, is where now we're going to set up our Windows 10 machine so it can talk to our Raspberry Pi. So what we just did now is we installed, installed Samba on our Raspberry Pi so it can talk to our Windows 10 machine. Now we need to go to the Windows 10 machine and tell it, hey, I have a Raspberry Pi that I want you to talk to. Because what that'll allow us to do is go on the internet, download our ROMs, and then we can transfer from our Windows 10 computer to our Raspberry Pi. And then you should be ready to play. All right, so give that a shot. All right, we're almost there. I know it seems like a lot of steps, but uh, trust me, it's worth it. It'll make it'll, it'll be a lot of fun, and you're you're learning a lot as we go here too. You're learning about networking and operating systems, and a lot of good skills. Um, and so, just try to get through this, and it'll be worth it. All right. So now, what we need to do is we need to turn on Samba in Windows. So I'm on a Windows computer here. Again, I'm on Windows 10. If you're on a Mac or a Linux or some type of other operating system, you're going to have to look up how to do this. You know how to use Samba on those. Does, systems. Samba was really designed for Windows networking, so this is going to be a lot easier if you're on Windows. So what we need to do is we're going to go down to the search menu, a little search button. I'm just going to search for the control panel. So I type, you know, the first few letters of control and that pops up and I'll launch the control panel app. And then we're going to go to the option here, our settings, our program settings. And then up here there'll be an option that says turn Windows features on or off. So I'm going to click that. And you, I do believe you need to be an administrator on your computer, so you have to have the account that allows you to make some of these system level changes. So if you, that doesn't work, that probably means your account is not an administrator. So ask somebody in your house, a parent, an adult, uh, somebody else that uh, maybe uh, uh, has control of that computer and they'll have to give you access. But you're gonna scroll down here, and I already have it turned on, but you're looking for this thing that says SMB, that's short for Samba, 1.0, CIFS, not sure what that is, something file system, I think, file sharing support. That's the key there, file sharing support. So I want this one here, SMB, and you should have a little plus next to it. And I just need to install the client. So you notice on mine, I've already done it because I've set this up ahead of time. Um, but that little checkbox is probably not there on yours. You're going to click that check checkbox and then hit OK. And then what it'll do is it'll install. I don't think it'll make you restart your computer. Actually, I think it does make you restart your computer, right? When you're making some of these system level changes, whether it's on Windows 10 or Raspberry Pi, um, you often have to do a complete risk, uh, system restart so those changes take effect. So you'll hit OK. Um, I'm just going to hit Cancel because I already hit, well, I, actually, I can hit OK. It'll be fine here. And then what will happen is once you reboot, what should 
what should work now, as long as everything is set up correctly, right, that's a big if, but if everything's set up correctly, what will happen is you should now be able to transfer uh, a ROM file, and we'll go in our next step, we'll look at where to get some of those, as I mentioned earlier. You should be able to transfer a ROM file from your Windows 10 computer to your Raspberry Pi. So what will happen is when you open up your file manager here, you'll go over to Network, and you might have to click Refresh the Network. You have to make sure your Raspberry Pi is turned on, Every it's booted up, it's running, um, it's connected to Wi-Fi or Ethernet, and then you might have to hit the little refresh button here, or you can press F5 on your keyboard, and if everything's set up correctly, you should see uh, RetroPie listed as a, as a place that you can click on. So now when I double-click on it, now I'm actually connected via my Wi-Fi network to my Raspberry Pi, and then I would go to ROMs. And these are all the different systems that are on my device. So these are all the different emulators I can use. I'm going to show you just how to put something in NES, the Nintendo Entertainment System, but depending on what games and what ROMs you download, and we'll, like I said, we'll look at that on the next step, um, you have to put it in the correct folder. So I'm, I'm going to get some NES or Nintendo Entertainment System ROMs, and so I'd go in here, and then these are some ROMs that I've already downloaded, and all I have to do is just copy and paste them from my, like, you know, my downloads folder here. I can just copy them from here and paste them into this folder and now when I go to the Raspberry Pi they should show up under the NES entertainment system and I should be able to play my games okay so the next and kind of final step before we actually play is um, how to actually get some ROMs and then I'll, go, I'll, I'll probably go through this process one more time about how to transfer them from your Windows 10 machine to your Raspberry Pi so that'll be the, the pretty much the last step so we'll look at that next All right, so as we talked about earlier, you need to get ROMs, or what, that's what we generally refer to is instead of calling them games, we call them ROMs. So where do you get some ROMs? As I mentioned prior, or if you didn't watch that part of the video, uh, getting ROMs off the internet of games that you don't own is technically illegal. So I'm not going to show you where to get those, because you technically need to own the cartridge. So if you want to get this Nintendo game, RC Pro-Am, you have to own the cartridge like I do. And so I have the cartridge, so technically I'm allowed to have a digital copy of the game. Um, it's kind of a gray area, and I don't want to go down that rabbit hole because it can be a little, uh, uh, just, it's not clear. So if you want to get those trademark copyright games, they're not hard to find, put it that way, but I'm not going to show you where. But there are some places, some links here that I've included, and those these will be in the description of, of things called ROM hacks. ROM hacks are actually a little more gray area as well, but I'll show you some of those. And then a couple places where you can get games that the creators have made for free. So you have all the right to get those because they have, they, the creator has said you, you can use them. So here's a collection of some NES games on itch.io, which is a great uh, website for indie games, and you can download some of these NES games here. Generally, if you just Google NES or SNES or Sega or whatever system you're looking for in the word ROMs, you probably won't have too hard a time finding things. But do be careful, like anything on the internet, a lot of those sites are set up to trick you. And you start downloading things and you can download viruses and spyware and really mess up your computer. So again, I'm not going to show you those sites. You, I'll leave that to you. But the ones I'm including here are all safe places to go. And you don't have to worry necessarily about legality because the authors of these have said you're allowed to download them and that's fine some of these you have to pay for so you know because again it takes a lot of talent and a lot of time to make these so the creators want to be compensated they want to be paid which i don't blame them because it's a great resource that they're providing here right here are some homebrew games homebrew can be a little more tricky on whether there's it's legal or not um but to, most people agree that these these games are are probably okay to download without worrying too much about trademark and copyright infringement. Um, and then ROM hacking. ROM hacking is really cool, but it's definitely a gray, gray area. So it's basically taking an existing game, a copywritten game, and then hacking it. So maybe you put Sega in a Super Nintendo game, or uh, you put Sega in like a Mario Brothers game or something. Or here, here's a Yoshi game where they've re, they've hacked Yoshi. Uh, a Yoshi game. So the, these are really cool because they're kind of different and in, in, um, they present some interesting ways and some creative take take on technology. It's considered, it's considered, I think, in a lot of cases, fair use because you're kind of re, redefining the work of art. But again, it's a little bit of a gray area. So I am telling you to, to avoid the illegal stuff and just don't start downloading games that you don't own. Um, it's a slippery slope and you can get yourself into some trouble 
um, if if you get crazy with that, particularly if, if you share them. That's where people really get in trouble is when they start hosting them and sharing them. But once you have some ROMs, then like I said, you have your network set up on your Raspberry Pi, you have your Windows 10 Samba set up. You'll, all you'll need to do is go to your File Explorer. So here's, I'm in File Explorer on Windows 10. Um, you should have the network over here on the left. So you'll click on Network. Um, it should refresh automatically, but if it doesn't, you can press this refresh button here and it'll recheck your network and then it'll go out and it's looking, you can notice here, here's a status bar. It's looking for open networks. And if you've installed Samba correctly on your Raspberry Pi, look at the prior steps. If you don't, if you skip that or you don't remember how to do that, eventually what will happen is it'll pop up here. It'll say RetroPie. Um, so I refresh mine. So it can be a little slow depending on the speed of your network and how many things are connected to your network. I'm on Wi-Fi here. And, and as we speak, there's a lot of people using Wi-Fi. So it's a little slow. But you notice here, here's Raspberry Pi. Or sorry, RetroPie. Let me go back. I want to go to the one that says RetroPie. Then I'm going to go to ROMs. And then here are all the different systems or the emulators that are included in RetroPie. I downloaded some NES open source or hacked or open, you know, kind of uh, retro hacked games. And then I just drag over the zip file. Now notice here, it's going to say, generally when you download a file, it'll either be a .rom. If it is, you can just drag that over or it'll be a .zip file. If you know what a zip file is, it's basically a file that's been zipped up or it kind of uh, packaged up into one. Don't unzip it if you know what that means. If you know how to do that on a computer, don't do that because RetroPie is designed to unzip the games automatically. So just put the .zip file or the .rom file in the appropriate folder of whatever system you want to run and reboot the Raspberry Pi. Again, you have to reboot it to tell it you because you've kind of made like a system level change. And when you reboot, you should see a screen that has all your emulators uh, wh for whatever systems you downloaded and you can go ahead and start playing. OK, so sounds like a lot of steps and it really is. Um, I've done this enough times where it, it starts you know, kind of flowing together, but I'll, I'll be honest, the first maybe four or five times I did it, I ran into some issues. I'm going to provide some extra resources in the description here to help you, um, but go ahead and give that a try. And then we're going to do one more step here um, of, of some things you can do to, to, let's say you get this working and you're ready to kind of take this to the next step, or maybe you've figured this part out already and you're looking at some more things you can do with retro consoles on the Raspberry Pi. So that'll be the last thing we'll look at. All right. So stay tuned for that. All right, congratulations on getting this far. So hopefully everything worked for you. If not, this is definitely one of those projects where you have to try and uh, make some mistakes and, and, and find some resources online. These links that you see here in front of you, these links will be in the description and these will help you if you're running into some issues as well. But definitely don't give up. It, it, it can be a little tricky at first. I will say it's gotten a lot easier and they're always making updates to RetroPie. So they, they've They've tried to do as many things to make it easy as possible, but it's not a perfect solution. And what you're doing is pretty complex. So just be patient and you'll get through it and you'll get it. And it's definitely worth the wait because you can play a lot of cool games, uh, literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds on your ret your Raspberry Pi retro console, uh, which is really neat. So th these are three great links here that will give you more information. I base a lot of my tutorial off this first link here. This is from the official Raspberry Pi website, their blog. Uh, again, these links will all be in the description. Um, Raspberry Pi, the organization, it's actually a nonprofit organization based out of the UK. They have a whole book on retro gaming with the Raspberry Pi, so I definitely recommend picking that up. You can buy it, a hardcover or a, like a mag, it's more of like a magazine type book. You could buy that, or you can actually, uh, uh, download it for free as a PDF. So you don't even have to purchase it. They give it away for free, which I love the Raspberry Pi. They're always giving away a lot of their information, um, and trying to make it as accessible as possible. And then there's a good article down here as well. Um, but again, look for these links and more in the description. But one last thing you might want to do is once you've kind of built just this simple, uh, you know, Raspberry Pi, I've, I've put mine in a case now that I'm done. So there's a little case here and it's got a little some feet and I could stick this under my TV and have my, you know, controller hooked into it. Um, have the power hooked in and just stick it under my TV or even mount it on the back of my TV with a little glue or, um, you know, Velcro or that type of thing. But if you want to go to the next step, you can actually build a cabinet. And so this over here on the left is called a tabletop cabinet. So it sits on the table, but you could even build a big one, a stand up cabinet, or, and here's another tabletop one. So there's a lot of other things you can do once you get the Raspberry Pi, the software side of things configured, you can actually then start building some custom hardware cabinets for your 
for your uh, for your gaming and, and kind of go crazy with it. So again, um, thanks for making it all this way. I hope uh, you know towards the end. I hope everything worked out for you. Um, please check out the links in the description for more uh, assistance, and I'll put my contact information uh, in there as well. And I'd be happy to 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 communicate through email or that type of thing if you have more questions. But good luck and um, have fun retro gaming with your Raspberry Pi.